of you can be turning to Mark chapter 1. I know for the past few Sundays we've been looking at events that surround the arrest, trial, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus as we inch closer to Easter Sunday. But this morning I want to take us back to the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Not his birth, because Mark doesn't talk about that. Uh, But the beginning of his ministry. And so we're going to start out in Mark chapter 1 this morning. You know, we are blessed here in Shakota, America, to, to live in a community um, where church attendance is just part of our culture. That's a good thing. Amen? And nobody thinks any differently of you for going to church, but it, in some parts of the world, if you go to church, especially if you go to a Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church, you're looked down upon. You don't have to worry about that here. That's a blessing. Unfortunately, there are a whole lot of folks that are just churchgoers and they don't believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God, or at least they don't live their lives like they believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And tragically, one of these days, and I say this at just about every funeral that I preach, Everybody here is going to meet God. We're going to meet Jesus one of these days. But we're either going to meet him as our Savior or as our judge. And folks, it's far better to meet him as Savior than it is as judge. And our churches are made up of people who are are faithful to the Lord, who love the Lord, who who come here and want, want to serve the Lord. And our church is also made up of people who just come just because it's Sunday morning, so you come. I'm glad you're here. Don't run out the door just because I said that. But church is something that we need to do and to be rather than just some place to go. Amen? We're a family. We treat each other like family. In fact, we probably treat each other better than family. And that's a good thing. But there's something, church is something special. It's who we are. It's not just what we do, but it's really who we are. Because God calls us the church. And he's given us a mission to do. But he also refers to us as the body of Christ. And we're also referred to as the bride of Christ. And so a relationship with Jesus is something to be enjoyed And not just on Sunday morning. Amen? It's something that we ought to enjoy every day of the week and every part of every day of the week. Now, there are a lot of folks who only encounter Jesus on Sunday mornings and possibly Wednesday nights. And it just shouldn't be that way. And what I would like to do this morning is take the opportunity to show you the danger of leaving Jesus at church. So I've entitled this message, Don't Leave Jesus at Church. I mean, he's here, amen? When you got here this morning, he greeted you. He's, he's here with us. But don't leave him here. Because in a little while, when we get finished, we're all going to leave here. The lights are going to go out. The doors are going to be locked. Don't leave Jesus here. Take him home with you. And what we're going to be looking at this morning is a passage of Scripture where Jesus' first four disciples took him home with him. And it's a beautiful thing. And we're, we're going to look at that. Uh, in fact, let's just read. I'm going to read a few verses and then we're going to talk about a few more. But beginning in verse 21 of our text passage, Mark chapter 1, it says, Then they went into Capernaum and immediately on the Sabbath, he, meaning Jesus, entered the synagogue and taught. And they, meaning everybody that was there in the church, were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Now there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? 
I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. Then they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, Who is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And immediately his fame spread throughout all the region around Galilee. That's quite a way to start your worship day, isn't it? Did anybody drag any devils with you in here this morning? I'm amazed that the synagogue was a place where, until Jesus showed up, even demons apparently were comfortable there. What's wrong with that picture? I mean, Jesus goes in to worship and he begins to teach. And demons know who Jesus is, even though nobody else knew who he was. Jesus was the Son of God, and the demons knew that. The Gospel of Mark, the whole Gospel, it, it begins in a different way than the other Gospels do. There's nothing in the Gospel of Mark about Jesus' uh, birth or childhood or any of those things. Somebody did bring a devil with them this morning. <laughs> kind of makes you want to throw your cell phone in the trash, don't it? Now, listen, I, the Bible doesn't tell us what Jesus talked about, what he taught, what he preached about when he was in the synagogue this morning, but it didn't make any difference. It was the Son of God speaking. It was God in the flesh delivering a message. And, and by the way, I can pretty much guess because this was early on in Jesus' ministry. And what did he talk about early in his ministry? He just picked up where John the Baptist left off. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I got an idea that was probably what he was talking about. Because that's what he did. But the speaker in the synagogue was the sinless son of God. And this demon knew it. So there was a great message that was preached there was a great ministry that had been done. Jesus, he, he exercises the demons out of this man. And then everybody there wants to know, who in the world is this? That's never happened around here before. I dare say it hadn't happened around here before either. But it should. So there's a great miracle. Now, let me just point out that at this time, Jesus only had chosen four. There's only four disciples. So those four disciples went to church with him that morning. If you read earlier in, in the first chapter here, Jesus had called uh, James and John and Andrew and Simon Peter to be disciples. Four fishermen. He asked them to come, and they came. And they were his only four disciples so far. And when this happened, it says, not only were these four disciples amazed and astonished at what they were witnessing, but everybody was. Listen, I can guarantee you that if something like that happened in our service this morning, you're going to be telling everybody about it this week. Amen? It doesn't take long for news like that to make it around. And we're going to see that as we go a little farther here this morning. They were all amazed in so much that they questioned among themselves, what in the world is going on? Who is this? And what is he doing? And how can he speak with such authority? Well, we have to remember, he's the one that wrote it. Amen? He wrote the book. Now, we know that everything there is to know about Jesus, we cannot find in the Bible. But everything we need to know about Jesus we can find in the Bible. And Jesus is who he always said he was, the Son of God. What a day this must have been. I would imagine that after all this, nobody was ready to leave. Have you ever gone to one of those church services that when it was over, you just didn't want to go? 
And at the same time, there were some people that as soon as the last amen was said, they ran to the door. But for most of us, when we, when we get excited about something that's going on inside the house of God, we just want to stick around. I've been to a few services like that. I didn't want to go because I wanted to continue to commune with Jesus. And this is exactly what happened with Andrew, Peter, James, and John. These first four disciples. Because after the service was over with, and the people were all excited, and as they were, they didn't have lights to turn off, but after the lights were off and the doors were locked and everybody was going to their homes, these four disciples said, hey, let's go back to our place. P Peter says, let's, let's go back to my place. And they took Jesus with them. Now, what happened is they were enjoying, and I've only got three points this morning, but the third one is about a mile long, so I'm going to get to the first one here. You can enjoy a personal relationship with Jesus. I hope everybody here has a personal relationship with Jesus. You know the author of the book. You know the miracle worker here in Mark chapter 1. You know who he is. You know what his message is. You know what his purpose is. You enjoy it. And in verse 29, it says, now, as soon as they had come out of the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. This passage describes some men, four men, who even though Jesus had just called them to be their disciples, they already had a personal relationship with Jesus. When you got saved, you remember that day, right? You remember when you gave your heart to Jesus? You began a personal relationship with Jesus Christ on that day. Wow, was that exciting, wasn't it? You felt like the world had been lifted off of your shoulders when you first got saved, amen? Understandably, because it had. The weight of sin had been lifted off of you, and you enjoyed that personal relationship with Christ. And... That's the beginning of the relationship that Christ had with them. Uh, in fact, if you, if you went back up and read verses 16 through 20, you can see where Jesus called them. Our relationship with Jesus began in a similar way. Jesus called them out. Jesus is just walking along the seashore, and he sees two guys, and he says, Hey, I want you guys to come and follow me. Jesus searched them out. He called them. And they came to him. He walks a little bit farther and he sees two more that are on a boat mending their nets. And he calls them. All four of these guys are fishermen. They're just out doing their job. But Jesus personally goes out and he calls them. And folks, when you got saved, that's what Jesus did for you. He called you to come. He invited you to have that personal relationship with him. It's an important relationship. Jesus said, no man comes unto me except it were given unto him by my Father. I'm glad that Jesus came looking for me. If you're born again, it's because Jesus came looking for you. And he found you. And he called you. And you accepted that call. You accepted that, the, the terms that Jesus gave you. And you accepted him as your personal Savior. Uh, and I would also like us to consider the importance of this relationship. It turned these four men. And there would be eight more that would be called out. But these four men, it turned their lives upside down. They were never the same again. In fact, they left all that they had. They left their families. Now, this is the beginning of the end for their family relationship here for these four. Because we're about to see another miracle take place here in just a moment. But for these four, they never really went back home again to stay. Their whole lives were about taking the message of Jesus to the world had a conversation with somebody this week and he said what happened to all the disciples and I said well all of them but one died for their faith they were all martyred they all willingly gave their lives for Jesus there's so much that we are told about Jesus in the Bible but you know there's so much more that when we get to heaven we're going to learn about what more about Jesus but you know even in the gospel of John we're told that if everything was written about Jesus that there was to be written that there's not enough paper in the world to write it down on 
But everything we need to know is right here. All that we need to know is right here. What's important for us to know, we have possession of that in our, in our words. Jesus didn't just come and save us from our sins and leave us alone until we get to heaven. He loves us so much that he desires that we come and we have that relationship, that we abide in him, daily in him. And it leads us to another truth concerning uh, what happens when you take Jesus home with you. Not only do you enjoy a personal relationship with him, and it's true that you do, but you also can enjoy precious fellowship with him. Do you fellowship with Jesus on a daily basis? You know, we like, uh, it's good to have Travis back. We, we finally get to talk to Travis. By the way, Travis is almost 50. I know nobody lives to be 50. I mean, that's, whew. but Travis is almost 50 years old. He was born back in the 18, no, never mind. Uh, <laughs> but listen. We enjoy the fellowship, don't we? I mean, I've told you all this before. I'd rather come to church for a, a fellowship dinner than to go to a family reunion because I'm pretty sure a fight's not going to break out here. You might, you might have to call the police at a family reunion to come in and break up the fight. But when the disciples departed the synagogue that day, they were able to continue to fellowship with Jesus. So let's look and see what happened. When they left, when they left the synagogue, it's just Jesus and his four new disciples. And they go someplace that was very important to Simon and Andrew. They went to Simon Peter's house. Verse 29. Now as soon as they had come out of the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife's mother, this is Simon Peter's mother-in-law, lay sick with a fever. And they told her, him about her at once so he Jesus came took her by the hand lifted her up and immediately the fever left her and she served them how, how many of you ladies if you've been sick I mean you're sick enough you've got a fever that as soon as you get over the fever you get up and you start cooking for everybody serving people no, a fever will wear you out, won't it? But the miracle was so great that she was ready to go. She couldn't wait to start serving. That's a miracle. This passage to me, this event proves that we too can spend time with Jesus. And it's going to be quality time. This was quality time. By the way, this is another miracle that as soon as everybody heard about it, people started gathering outside of Andrew and, and Simon Peter's house. They wanted to know what was going on. These four fishermen, unlike us, were blessed to be in the service and see the great miracle that took place. They were able to hear from, from Jesus teaching the crowd. This, this was kind of their introductory church service here. They were going to church for the first time. And what they saw was Jesus Christ and the miracles that he could perform and, and that he did. And then he comes home and he does another miracle for them in their own house. And we know that the more time that we spend with someone, the greater we get to know them, right? <clears throat> Christy, and I, I'll just give you a, a quick example. This week, Christy and I have been married for almost 43 years. And I thought, man, I know everything there is to know about her and her family. And this week, we got a new revelation. We found... We found out this week that not only does insanity run in my family, it runs in hers too. <laughs> Neither one of us knew about that. Our kids don't have a chance. Uh, I, I'd like to say I'm kidding, but I'm not. But anyway, Jesus, Jesus is just the kind of person that you want to know more, right? I mean, if you know him... You want to know him, and then when you know him, you want to know more about him. And again, everything that we need to know is here, but we just want to know who he is, and we want to spend as much time with him as possible. And even though there may be somebody in your life, like a husband and wife, and you think you know everything there is to know about them, you don't. And maybe you think you know everything there is to know about Jesus, but you don't. And you won't ever know everything there is to know about him. And even though from Genesis to Revelation, from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, it's filled with Jesus. 
you're still not going to know everything there is to know. And as comprehensive as the Bible is, it doesn't even begin to scratch the surface. Now, there's a lot that we don't know, but the Word of God does tell us what we need to know. And when we spend time in the Word, we're spending time with Jesus. We're spending time learning how He thinks. By what He did, we spend time learning how we should do. And we have an amazing privilege to enjoy precious fellowship with the Savior and we can spend time with Jesus and we can also seek help from Jesus. How many of you even just this past week have had days where you just cried out to the Lord to help you? You're going through a particular struggle and you just say, God, I, I can't do it on my own. I'm going to have to trust you. Peter had faith that Jesus could help his mother-in-law. And when given the opportunity, Jesus performed a miracle in his mother-in-law's life. He takes her by the hand, he lifts her up, and immediately the fever left her. We've got a lot of folks that have been sick in recent days, and a lot of prayers have gone up on, on their behalf, your behalf, if you're one of those that we've been praying for. Thank the Lord for people who will be willing to pray for you, and especially in a time of need. Right now, there's been a whole lot of prayers going up for some of you, a whole lot of prayers going up for the Prince family and for others who've recently lost loved ones. And, and this type of growth only occurs with those who are willing to take Jesus home with them and learn who Jesus is. And when you take Jesus home with you, you can enjoy that personal relationship and that precious fellowship and finally, you can enjoy profitable discipleship. Well, what do I mean by profitable discipleship? Well, thanks for asking. I'm glad you asked because I'm going to talk about that for a little bit. Christian discipleship is, in most churches, forgotten. And I know about a year ago, I preached a whole series of messages on discipleship. And I'm not going to re-preach that series this morning. But we're not only called to learn from the teachings of Jesus, we're called to live them out. It's one thing to learn who Jesus is and about him and his character and his personality and, and all that he did. But see, when Jesus left the disciples and he left us, he left us with a mission, with a purpose. And what is that purpose? As disciples, we are to be disciples and to make disciples. And then we are to teach those disciples how to make more disciples. And so discipleship involves several things. And the first one is learning. Just learning how to be a disciple. Learning what a disciple is and learning to be one. And verse 32, it says, At evening when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. You see, the, the word of what he'd done for Peter's mother-in-law had got around in a hurry. And then, verse 34, he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons and he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him listen i gotta tell you whenever i read passages of scripture like this i i, I just scratch my head because i i don't i can't really relate to this kind of power on a first-hand basis I've heard missionaries talk about exorcisms and casting out demons and that kind of stuff. And, and I went to high school with a guy who everybody in the county was convinced that he was demon-possessed, and as far as I know, he still is. Demon possession in our culture doesn't seem to be a big thing, especially around the church, but folks, I'm going to tell you, there's just as many demons now as there was in Jesus' day. 
There's just as many people in Shakota that are walking around demon-possessed as there probably were in the towns and villages that Jesus ministered in. They just don't come to church. But if they did, and we could have a service or an experience like this, I can't imagine that anything could happen except revival. Except people coming to Jesus Christ as their Savior. And after this miracle in the synagogue and the healing of Peter's mother-in-law, all the, all the sick folks and all the demon-possessed people, they were coming out of the woodwork to come to Jesus. Why? Because they knew that he and only he could do something about the situations that they were in. And the disciples were here. They were watching this. They were observing this. They were a part of this. And eventually, before Jesus was done, he would give them the power to do the same thing. So discipleship involves learning. It also involves trusting. Listen, even though Peter had only knew Jesus for a short period of time, he trusted him. Well, what's not to trust? This is the Son of God in the flesh. And Peter believed that. He, he believed it early on. And Andrew, his brother as well, and James and John, they, they believed that Jesus was the Son of God. So they trusted him. And the more miracles they saw, the more they trusted him. And likewise, the more time we spend with Jesus, the more our faith in Jesus will grow. And after healing many in this multitude, Jesus and his disciples, the Bible says, they left. Look at verse 35. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. And when they found him, they said to him, e everyone's looking for you. I don't know that they realized how important it was for Jesus just to get alone for a little while, just him and God and have their little conversations. You see, Jesus went out to pray, and he did that often, to go by himself and pray. But the disciples wouldn't leave him alone. Now, what's going on here? What's going on is there were people that continued to come. I know it says that everybody in that village had gathered there at the door of Andrew and Peter's house. But again, when Jesus healed everybody, it didn't take long for that news to spread to other villages. And, and there were other people that came to, to Andrew and Peter's house and they wanted to be healed too. And, and we're going to get to Jesus' response to that in just a second. But listen, the disciples went out and they found Jesus. Why? Because not only did they trust him, but... They wanted everybody else to trust him as well. And so they said, listen, everybody's looking for you. In other words, there's more people that want to be healed. And then verse 37 says, they found him and they said, everybody is seeking you. Now, we're not told a whole lot about this multitude, but we can assume that it was made up of the same kind of people that Jesus had already healed the evening before. And whatever the need the disciples cared enough to go out and try to find Jesus so that he could come and finish the job. But Jesus' response is interesting because he doesn't stop there. When they said to him there in verse 37, everybody's looking for you, he said to them in verse 38, let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also because for this purpose I have come forth. Jesus doesn't go back to Andrew and Peter's house. He leaves to go to the next town and then the next town. Why? Because there's people everywhere that need to know about Jesus. Now, I'm impressed that the disciples were caring enough to, to come and try to convince Jesus to come. But Jesus has a different plan. This wasn't a part of his plan. Disciples, discipleship, and according to this passage, involves not only learning and trusting and caring it also involves sharing and they're trying to do that and the disciples sought Jesus so that the crowd uh, could be addressed and Jesus could heal them all 
But it also involves obeying because when Jesus says, no, we're not going to go back into your town. We're going to go to the next town and then the next town. And what do the disciples do? They don't argue with him. They don't try to grab a hold of him and pull him back home so that he can go heal more people. You know what they did? They just obeyed him. And when he left to go to the next town, they went with him. That's what true disciples do. They go wherever it is that Jesus tells them to go. But I don't want to go. Yes, you do. You just don't know it. Now, there's a lot of folks that wouldn't do what the disciples did. And in fact, before Jesus' ministry was done, there would be a lot of people that would turn their backs on Jesus. There would be a lot of people who would leave Jesus to go back into the world. And I, I can almost guarantee you that when Jesus said, no, we're not going to go back, we're going to go to the next town and the next town and the next town, that that answer took the disciples by surprise. But again, they didn't question him, and they didn't try to talk him out of it. They obeyed. And listen, folks, even when it doesn't make sense, if God tells you to do something, you best be doing it. That, that would be the best thing for you to do is just do whatever it is. And intertwined with obedience is the fact that discipleship involves following. And verse 38 tells us, and when he said, let's go into the next town that I may preach there also, because for this purpose I have come forth. And as he was preaching in their synagogues throughout all Galilee and casting out demons, that, and we get to verse 40, a leper comes and, and Jesus heals him. The point I'm trying to make is God knows best. Jesus knew what was best. And it was best rather than turning around and going back to keep going forward and go to the next town and to the next town and to the next town so that as many as could hear Jesus and come to Jesus as possible would. We need to be obedient to our master, even when sometimes it may not be convenient. And again, let's go back to Andrew and Peter. This was at their house that all this took place. The Bible doesn't say much more about if they ever went back home or if they did, how long they stayed. But listen, I'm going to tell you now, they didn't have time to go back and do much because they were busy doing their father's business. They were busy doing the call of God upon their life. And we need to follow our master, and it's imperative that we remain with Jesus no matter what. And that is my final little sub point is discipleship involves just remaining, just stay in the course, doing what it is that the Lord's asking us to do. The disciples followed Jesus throughout all of Galilee and beyond. They saw miracle after miracle. Uh, I mean, wouldn't you love to have just witnessed one of the miracles? If you ever saw Jesus in the flesh perform a miracle, do you think you'd ever leave Jesus? I'd like to think I wouldn't, and yet the closer we get to Easter, the more we're going to be talking about what the disciples did. When the going got rough, they scattered like a bunch of rabbits, didn't they? After being with Jesus for more than three years. Now, even though there were people in the, in the church that day that were amazed by Jesus, they were intrigued, they were astonished by his teaching, they were fascinated by the miracles that he performed, but unfortunately, some of those folks went home unchanged. Some of those folks would be the folks that three years down the road would be yelling, crucify him. Maybe some of these folks would even be some of the people that actually nailed him to the cross. Sad, isn't it? Understand that you may attend church regularly, enjoy the fellowship of one another regularly, sing songs of praise, participate in worship, read your Bible. You listen to a message from God's word and you, you may be strengthened and encouraged by it. These are all good things. And I'm not trying to downplay any one of them. I'm just telling you that according to the word of God, they're not enough. If you're not spending time with Jesus every day, 
you're missing out. You're missing out on spiritual growth. I, I'm amazed at people that who would tell you that they've been saved for 50 years and you ask them where a book in the Bible, and I'm not talking about one of the minor prophets. I'm asking, you know, I, I've asked people, well, I'll never forget one of the first sermons that I preached right after I answered the call to preach. I went to, to Christy's mom and dad's church, their home church, and I preached out of the book of Habakkuk. And I'll never forget, the pastor of the church was sitting on the front row, and when I asked people to turn in their Bibles to the book of Habakkuk, he had to go to the index because he didn't know where it was. Now, that wasn't funny to me. That was sad that people don't know enough about the Word to know where to find, especially for a preacher. You see, the point is this. We have the opportunity as disciples to enjoy a life abundant. That's what Jesus said he wanted to give. He said, I bring you life. I bring you abundant life. What is abundant life? That's life that's just filled with joy. A joy unspeakable. We talked about this a little bit this past Wednesday evening in our Bible study. We have that opportunity. And we can take Jesus home with us this morning and we can grow in our faith and we can have an impact on the kingdom of God because that's what he's calling us to do is to have an impact. Now, what does that look like for you? I don't know. I don't know what it looks like for you. I think I know what it looks like for me, but I don't know what it looks like for you. I just know that that's what every one of us are called to do. We're called to be people of faith, to have a personal relationship with Jesus, to enjoy precious fellowship. And be disciples. Everybody in this building has that same call. There are no exceptions. That's what the Lord is calling every one of us to do and to be. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed. I know that there are going to be some who will leave this place. The lights are going to be turned off. The doors are going to be locked. But before that happens. I just want to ask you to do one thing. Make sure when you leave this building, you take Jesus home with you. What does that look like for you? I don't know. I'm just going to tell you, don't leave the church without Jesus. Maybe you don't possess a personal relationship with Jesus Christ this morning. Well, that can change. It can change today if you let it. I believe he's calling men and women this morning to follow him. And I encourage you, I beg you, I plead with you to repent of your sins and trust him as Lord. Surrender to him and you too can be one of his disciples. You should be one of his disciples. Whatever your situation, don't leave Jesus at church. Father, thank you for your word. And Lord, we thank you for this passage of Scripture. And, and I know we didn't have time to, to do everything with this passage of Scripture that we want to do with it. But Lord, thank you that you love us. Thank you, Father, for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to live and to die for us. And while he's living here on this earth, he did so many great things. And some of those are recorded for us. And, and we've looked at several of them this morning. But Lord, we're more grateful that you not only sent Jesus to live and to die for us, but more importantly, that he conquered death, that he resurrected, and that he did it for us. And that right now he's preparing a place for those of us who trust him as Savior, for those of us that have this personal relationship with him. And one of these days, every one of us is going to breathe our last. And we are going to see Jesus face to face. And Lord, I pray that you would help each and every one of us to make sure that we're ready to meet him as Savior and not as judge. And for however you choose to use the Holy Spirit in your word this morning, Lord, I pray that we'll just simply be obedient. That we'll do just what Jesus is asking us to do. Whatever that looks like for each individual here. So that his name can be magnified and glorified. And it's in his name that we pray.
Palin. I'm going to ask you to stand. Brother David's going to come and lead us in I Surrender All. And if you have any business that you need to do with the Lord, you do it right now while we sing.